Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for Correspondence Chess and the Impact of Artificial Intelligence. Before I continue, I want to make an accessibility statement regarding the space, the community room, which is T-Coil enabled. If you have T-Coil enabled devices, please feel welcome to switch them on at this time. If you don't have a T-Coil enabled device, but would like to use one of our headsets, I have made some available on top of the piano. I'll also request that you silence your cell phones for the duration of this program. My name is Cliff Robinson, and I'm the Public Humanities Specialist here at the Princeton Public Library. It is my honor today to introduce John Edwards, who will present his lecture, Correspondence Chess and the Impact of AI, a conversation with ICCF Grandmaster John Edwards. This program was made possible in part with support from the National Endowment. Just one year ago, John Edwards won the 32nd World Correspondence Chess Championship, a global competition managed by the International Correspondence Chess Federation, and dating back to 1950. He has become just the third American ever to win the World Correspondence Chess title. In so doing, he also became an ICCF Grand Master. John is also a member of the United States Correspondence Chess Olympiad team, which just won a bronze medal in the 21st Olympiad. That makes him the first resident of Hopewell Township, New Jersey, to win an <laughs> Olympic medal. <laughs> The U.S. Chess Federation has just presented John with an award as U.S. Grand Master of the Year for 2023. To give you a sense of the circles he has entered then, last year's U.S. Grand Master of the Year was the celebrated chess hero, Hikaru Nakamura. So fun trivia, John is the oldest American ever to win the Grand Master title at age 69 years and two months. He told me his age. I did not, <laughs> I did not disclose that myself. Uh, most often in chess, younger players are competing to see who will be the youngest Grand Master. And indeed, in the over-the-board game, chess players seem to peak in their late 20s. But in the corresponding game, players seem to peak in their late 60s. So John is apparently just peaking. <laughs> All right, well, everyone, join me in welcoming John Edwards. Thank you. Thank you. I want to make sure first, if we're going to be here a while. I want to make sure you can all hear me. Uh, what's up on the board is... Uh, Astounded. It's a puzzle from a deep dark past from 1972 when I was uh, an undergraduate here at the university. And I'm not going to show the solution for another hour, so I will let this haunt you a little bit. But what is astounding about this problem was that back in 1972, and indeed all the way up to about 2005, there wasn't a computer on this planet that could solve this. It was a computer killer, it was immune to analysis. Um, I'm spoiling our, where we're headed with all of this, of course, but the neural net machines that are commonly in place today solve this very difficult puzzle in a fraction, a tiny fraction of a second without fail. And I just wanted to place this within a certain context that obviously the technical environment has changed um, and bringing us along with, with the ride. So, hang on here. Um, I wanted to start with this because you're all going to have questions. These I, I, these may be some of your questions, I don't know, and I don't mean to insult anybody right off the bat, but these are the questions that I think are a little snarky. Um, these are people who, you know, they, they hear you became a world champion, and they're, they're instant, their instant take is, well, that can't really be all that meaningful. Um, so these are the questions that I'm asking. I'm just going to read through these, but I'm not going to answer them now. I promise I'm going to address every single one of these. Uh, people still play correspondence chess. Uh, how do we know you didn't cheat? That's one of my favorites. And I literally have had friends at dinner who have asked these questions. Um, how can a 70-year-old win a world chess championship? Uh, why not just let a computer make every move? At some level, everybody here has had this question privately. They just may not have the courage to say it. And you may be uncomfortable with the idea that I think that's a little snarky, but, but I'm going to address it completely. Uh, won't the player with the most powerful machine win? Uh, you got lucky, right? And then my favorite, after, after they've asked these questions, they run through them in one order or another, they inevitably get to the, the question that's really on their mind. So what engine did you use? Um, these questions are interesting, and I promise that I'm going to address each one of them in some detail, but I think that you should be aware that I regard these as the most interesting of the questions. These are mine. Um, yeah, by the way, those are the awards that I got. Cheryl and I went off to Amsterdam and came back loaded with hardware, made it through customs somehow without being harassed. So these are my questions. Why isn't every player, correspondence player, rated 2560? This is my new rating. Yay. Uh, why do neural net engines still be other neural net engines? That's actually really an interesting question to me. 
why are some correspondence players still winning? In other words, how, how could I have prevailed here if these machines are so strong that we can't beat them anymore? And then the real key question for today's talk um, is correspondence chess the canary in the coal mine, a harbinger of the world that we are creating and through which all of us are going to be living for the rest of our time on this planet? I think it's an incredibly powerful question and one that deserves our attention here today. So are you the top rated player in the world? 2560? Ah, 2560, so that's, that's a cool question. I, I will tell you, I have cared about becoming a grandmaster. I've cared about winning the world title. I have not cared one hoot about my rating, which happens to be 2560, which puts me at about 65th in the world, okay? And if you're saying, well, I can leave the talk, the guy's only rated 65th in the world, why am I wasting my time here? Um, I'm starting to care about rating now. So I just uh, beat a guy named Piers. I actually have the game if you're interested. And the, I should should back up a little bit. So this this talk is, I've organized this talk into two parts. The, the first part is to talk about some of the issues that I've just outlined. And the second part, we'll look at some of the chess. So if the idea of actually looking at chess is very bothersome to you, we'll take a break in about an hour for five minutes while I get something to drink. And then we're going to get, the first part of the chess is really fun. It's the games that are, Delightful, they are just amazing, but this is in the pre neural net era when it was possible to just destroy people if you were a decent player. And then the other part of these are, what is this neural net regime meant for the game of chess? And the games that you're going to see there, frankly, don't resemble the kind of chess that you may be familiar with. It, it is very, very different. As far as rating, I'm becoming interested in getting my rating up, and I've moved actually from 65th to about 25th in the world, and there is some hope to get me into, back into the top 10. It's a completely unimportant issue because having become world champion, the invitations that are coming and the things I'm being invited to are good enough and they wouldn't change if I got my rating up a few more points. But the question still remains. So if you use a really powerful machine and you do everything that I'm gonna show you here today, won't you be rated 2560? And while I'll get to that answer a little bit later, probably can surmise that I think the answer is no, um, that it takes quite a bit more than that. Um, I threw in this slide, I've given a variant of this talk in a few locales, but this is completely new and it has to be here because this talk is occurring in Princeton. And Princeton has a distinctly cool chess connection. And I at least wanted to pay some homage to the people who came before me. Um, in the upper left, um, that is Claude Shannon playing with Mikhail Bopinik. Claude has a reputation for, has, was, was one of the first to sort of put forth computer programs and the rest. I'm doing this a little bit out of order. In the lower left is John von Neumann uh, with the Maniac. This was a machine that was created here in Princeton um, with two primary goals. One was to determine the shape of the charge for a nuclear weapon. This is Oppenheimer, you've all seen the movie. And the other was at what height should the bomb go off if, if you want to maximize casualties on the ground. I'm sorry for the morbid, sharing the morbid thought. Used to be these are the, the the top secrets in the world, and they're no longer, of course, because you can calculate them on your on your, your iPhone. Um, the people who were programming this were not just interested in those problems; they were also interested, frankly, in other things, notably stellar evolution. They were interested in predicting the weather, which, by the way, they could do perfectly. They could predict tomorrow's weather perfectly. It just took them a month and a half to do it. Uh, and then there was Turing on the right, who was one of the first, maybe the first, to write a chess computer program using a graduate student here at Princeton. And in the upper right are three amazing people. That's Dennis Ritchie, Ken Thompson on the right, Brian Kernahan. Kind of hoping he might show up here today. That would have been amazing. Brian, of course, still teaches in computer science. But the three of them, they have a significant reputation for having given a C at Unix. Um, but the three of them, frankly, were most interested in chess. That's what they were doing. And they followed in with this heritage. And I will get into what they did, but their, their primary the primary contribution was something that we'll look into a little bit later called the table base. It was their feeling that opening theory for chess, as in so many other things, was getting to the point that it was pretty reliable, that if they could solve the end of the game, which is what the table base was meant to do, then all that was left um, for chess was some small conversation in the middle of the board, in the middle of the game. And if they could shrink the nature of that conversation in the middle, they were going to come close to solving the game. That was their approach. It turns out that it was never going to work, but they really gave it a really good shot. And I'll talk about why it wasn't going to work and why and what the nature of the approach that is working today. But I think we have to pay homage to this, this group of folks. I, I came here as an undergraduate 
1971. I was class of 75. And I made the mistake of doing most of my studying in the sport and fishing room, which is where all the chess books were, 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 were held. It's an astounding miracle that I graduated. Uh, forgive my um, inability here to put together something artistic, but these are just some, a handful of the headlines that have emerged in just the last six, seven months related to AI and its impact. And again, I, and you can read these for yourselves. To the extent, one of these is brand new, the scientists who solved the, the, the game of a fellow that happened about two or three days ago. It's an astounding accomplishment. But here's the point. A lot of this talk, for those of you who don't play chess or are, are, are here for all sorts of reasons other than chess, and your mind may start wandering, that's perfectly fine. I expect that your mind will wander from time to time during this talk. I ask simply that you let it wander in one interesting direction. All of you have an interest in something. I know that. This is an astounding community. Um, perhaps your interest is law, medicine, architecture. It doesn't matter, music. Allow your mind to wander to what the implications are for what I'm talking about, to what you love. There are parallels here. The work that has been done here has been done on chess. It was always meant to be a harbinger. It was always meant to be that canary in the coal mine. And now that chess is being solved, oh my gosh, I actually said it. Yes, chess is in the process also of being solved. And we'll talk a lot about what that means and where we are in terms of, of what that means. Um, but the implications are that if what I have done, correspondence chess as a distinctly sub, a distinct subset of chess was the first place where this solution was going to be applied. It is being applied. And I frankly will tell you, but although there are people who believe the game won't be solved for another 20 or 30 years, I think we're very close. I'll just spoil the surprise. Um, but if that's true, and allow your mind for the moment to believe that it's true, I want you to imagine what is that, what, is, what are the consequences, what are the implications for what it is that you love? And I think they're profound. I think they're a little scary. They're scary for young people who want to have careers in fairly traditional things. I want to become a programmer. Well, my goodness gracious, this stupid AI bot is going to be programming faster and more accurately than you can as a human. Um, and that's just likely to be very true very soon. And yes, it's a very scary thought. So yes, we're wiping out architects. We're wiping out musicians. Scary thoughts. Let me go back now. I'm going in and out of this. How my mind works. We're here in 1965. The fellow in the middle is Hans Berliner. He's the first American to win the World Correspondence Chess Championship. And he did that, you'll notice in this cross table, you can see the, the number of wins at the top row here, astounding how many games he won. This is one of the postcards that was sent to him. I actually own this. This is astoundingly cool. Yes, a notation here on the 23rd move coming in from Germany to Hong, actually signed, signed by Berliner. Very cool. Yeah, he did have hijack, which is what he was able to use. The rules were a little murky. He was using a computer, but he was a very, very, very strong chess player. So the combination allowed him to dominate this field. But his real database, and when I say database, for the very youngest people here, if I say the word database, just think of it as a container. Um, you think of a container as being something that holds milk or something of the sort. Uh, in this case, a database. It's a container to hold games. That's what it's doing. And we can have games that include your games or my games or your opponent's games or a tournament. And all the games in that tournament are all the games that have ever been played for a very large database. So yes, the word database is, is an interesting word and a half, but let us understand that it's simply a container. Um, they didn't have databases back then, not, not electronic ones. This is what they had. They had series, they had a lot of literature. So these are old tournament books. This is what was, this is the old database of the past. I've opened one of them up and it was actually, as you can see, it was ring bound so that you could move the pages around. Oh, I want to organize this by games in a certain opening or a certain ending or anything of the kind. Yes, we're able to sort this database manually by moving the pages within the ring binder. And here, this is Shock Arkley. This was put together by a world champion by the name of Max Erva, a personal idol, because in fact, he was the first of the actual over the board world champions who was an academic. And he approached the game that way as a matter of, of research and, and how you could apply that research throughout chess. This was my win. My name is misspelled there. It is just J-O-N, but this is the North American Championship in 96. Computer use was allowed, but the computers, even, even back in 96, was so bad that that wasn't the point. You could use them, it wasn't going to help much, and the databases sort of remained. This is uh, the, the chess informator, which came out uh, first uh, every uh, twice a year, then four times a year, and contained manually all of the, all of the games during that quarter or, 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 or twice a year. And the cool thing about the informant was that it was languageless. 
it was written in symbols so that anybody could read it as opposed to having to rely as Fisher did when he competed for the world championship. He had to rely upon Russian literature. If you've ever seen Russian chess literature, it, it's a skill unto itself. The, not the English language world, not to be outdone, produced this series called New and Chess. This is stopped publication, New and Chess. I beg your pardon, New and Chess has stopped. The informant is still going on. But right around the mid-90s, in the microcomputer universe, we started to get we started getting some, some interesting computer software. This is a screen from Chessbase. All Chessbase is, think of Chessbase as a collection of databases, those containers. And so Chessbase is something that helps you to manipulate those containers, those databases, so that I can now search for every game that's ever reached a certain position, search for every game that's reached a certain end game. I can start searching for every game of my opponents if they've been recorded. And life starts to get really interesting now. I can start doing very meaningful preparation from the privacy of my study. And you can see that as late as 96, I was able to dominate this field. There are tons and tons of wins here. This was really cool. I did not get a GM norm for this event, I add, because there weren't enough non-US players. If there'd been one more Canadian and I had lost to the Canadian, I would have had my grandmaster title 20 years before I got it, but there we go. Not complaining. This is my favorite quote of the day. This is Woody Allen in Stardust Memories, 1980. And you will recall he started making all those really funny movies with bananas and take the money and run and all sorts of other things like that. And then he started making all sorts of serious movies. So he complained in Stardust Memories, there's an alien who comes down and speaks to him and says, we love all of your movies, especially the early funny ones. I can only imagine how he must, very snarky comment, right? Uh, and I imagine that Woody Allen must have heard this four times a day. It's, it's not at all what he wanted to hear because he was very proud of his late movies. But I frankly get this myself. My early games are, and you're going to see this when I actually show up my chess, early games are just utterly delightful. There are sacrifices. There are cool combinations. There are theoretical novelties. I'll spoil a little to surprise you. So as an early correspondence player, I worked really stinking hard at the game, and I was able to find a new idea on the average of once every three days. Uh, that turned into one every week, then one a month. And today I can go six months, I'm working just as hard, and I can go six months without finding a single idea. Maybe I find one or two. Now either something's wrong with me or obviously this game is being played out, but that is one of our data points here today, that it's getting extremely hard using the same tools and the same approaches to find anything new under the sun. And again, I ask, if you're thinking about your own bailiwick, please extend this to what it is that you do. That it's going to become very hard. This happened first for us. It's going to happen for you too. That it's going to be really hard in what you do to find a way to compete against this equipment. These are five positions. I'm not going to go through them now, but I said at the end of the first hour, I will turn to some of these. And all of these represent some really interesting and fun chess. This is one of my favorite human beings on the planet. This is a picture of Pat Batten, who was the librarian at Columbia in the 80s. And it was at a time I was assistant VP for computing here at the university. And we were attempting to, to follow through on her mission, which was, as she said, to take the, the search out of research. That, that if you were an undergrad or even a graduate student and you were doing research, you spent so much of your time actually collecting the information rather than having wonderful experiences with the data. And that's what she wanted to do. She wanted to turn an undergraduate and graduate experience into simply working with the cool data so that if you were writing a paper about Thoreau, there would be a collection, a database, a collection of all of Thoreau's material, all the criticism of Thoreau, everything that was ever written, so that instead of having to spend your time in the library finding all of this, it would be presented to you and you could spend most of your time having interesting experiences with the data as opposed to having to search for the data. So this was, this is a, these are pictures of my library. This is the home library. This is a 7,000 book chess library, some of the images of it, and it's still extremely useful. Why? Because when I find a critical game in a database, I happen to know that Spassky against Portage in 1972 is the critical game that I need to investigate. My first thought is, in fact, to go to the library, find books that contain reference to that game, find out what Spassky and Portage had to say about the game, so that there is still some charm in having the written word just that that kind of experience is going away. This is the last of the quotes that I intend to read, but I don't like reading quotes unless they're really important. And I think this quote is just outstandingly cool. This is not Emmanuel Lasker, this is Edward Lasker, no relation. 1961, 
and Bofinick was extremely involved. That's his book on the right, he wrote a book called On the Cybernetic Goal of the Game. He believed that chess would be solved by machines, and Lasker writing in the American Chess Quarterly, volume one, number two. Now, volume one, number one is extremely valuable and cool. It has an article, Wildy Fisher's on the cover with an article that claims to find a bus to the King's Gambit. This is volume one, number two. It has an article in there by Edward Lasker about how chess computers will never amount to anything. I was very much surprised to read a statement imputed to Bofinick that the day will come when computers fully master chess and FIDE will have to establish grandmaster and master titles for these machines. This is, of course, nonsense. And I am sure that Bofinick was either joking or said something totally different. Now, of course, this talk is being recorded, which is dangerous because in 30 years, someone's going to find a quote that I'm saying here and they're going to come back and I'll be haunted by it. Um, but obviously, this, this statement is just, is just unfortunate nonsense from somebody who just assumed that computers were very good at sort of adding ones and zeros, but didn't understand some of the conceptual breakthroughs that we're going to be getting to shortly. So these screenshots are way too small for my taste, but it's supposed to be artistically done. PowerPoint loves doing stuff like this. So here we are. This is the, this is the modern correspondence chess environment that I have been living in for the last 12 years, 14 hours a day. As when I tell you the correspondence chess players don't get out much, it's just absolutely true. But this is, this is exactly what the environment looks like. So this is the process of actually sending a move. It brings up the current position. And if someone sent me a nice little message, I can respond with a message. It happens from time to time. These are the moves in the game. And we tend to be very careful because clerical mistakes can kill your chances in a tournament. So yes, I'll compare this to the board position in, my, in the chess space file that I'm working on. It records all of my work. This is the control panel, basically. This is the... The War Room for Correspondence Chess, this lists, it's actually fairly up to date, this lists all of the games that I have going on at any given time. I believe that I can bring it up directly on screen. Um, oh, I can't, it got closed. That's all right, I can do it later if anybody cares. There's a list of all the events that I've, I've been in. Um, this is a list of all of the people who have won the last World Championships, and my name is right in there. It's very small, but it's there. And this is a book that I wrote called Chess Base Complete. And this has become a kind of Bible for correspondence chess players and for over the board players as well. Um, chess Base is an incredibly powerful professional tool that is responsible for 11 year olds becoming grandmasters. It is an astounding thing. I was telling a young man at the back, he asked, how, how do I become a master? And the answer of course is you've got to play a lot. You have to play over the games of masters. And the last one, which I failed to tell him is that you've got to subject your own chess to scrutiny, preferably from a very strong player. Um, if you're willing to do that and take their take what they have to say, I've got some of my students in the audience, they know it can be very painful to realize, oh my gosh, I made that mistake. But if you're willing to confront that, you get better very, very rapidly. Chess Base Complete is the manual that Chess Base should have written. Um, but this becomes a path for other people to use this program quite effectively. Here, This is my win in the World Championship. This is not the winner's win. And you will notice that it is very different from those past events. There aren't a lot of wins here. This is a computer-driven environment. Computer use is legal. And yet there are still people winning at this level, just not as much. This is a plus two score. So I finished with nine. Oh, I'm in a tie. I, no, I did not share this. Because you'll notice that I finished with a tiebreaker one quarter point higher than the other three. Was it lucky? Of course, it's a little bit lucky. But we'll take it all the way home to a very nice silver platter and gold medal. Um, this, these for anybody who cares, and I will be happy to share the slides because I can't expect anybody here to, to be really meaningfully read this, but I have two servers that are mirrors of each other, both running Ryzen Threadrippers, um, 32 core at 3.7 gigahertz, if anybody cares about that level of detail. And these are, it's not one database that's being used here. It's not one collection of games. It is a range of databases here. Uh, there is a mega database. This is a little dated. The mega database that's currently used is 2024. Twick is the week in chess. This is a summary of all of the games of the week, and I keep that up to date. Correspondence chess database is completely unimportant because it's dated the moment it comes out, because there's something called the ICCF archive, which is a collection of all of the correspondence games that are played, and I keep that completely up to date. That single database, the, the database that contains the games of all correspondence chess players, is the single most important database in use today by everybody. Um, Magnus Carlson and company, they've got a team of 12 people, 10 people, 12 people, 
That is the database that they rely upon more than any of the others. Because the work that's being done by correspondence chess players in the opening and in the middle game is incomparable. And they use this in their preparation all the time. There are obviously others. The Paramount database is really interesting. I showed you what the informants look like, all those colored books on the shelf. This is a single database that contains all of those games. Is more because there are publications, and the publications themselves have their own databases. So that I can go in there and I can instantly say, oh, this position that I have was discussed in New and Chess magazine in 1986, and I need to go to page whatever. So this environment is, is professional, it's outstanding, it's neat. The last one down here, Chess Publishing, is small but worthy. These are grandmasters who combine to publish their analysis, they charge for it, of course. Uh, but again, you go in there and you get their thoughts about what's going on published already. And this is my attempt at humor. Uh, correspondence chess players have no sense of humor, so you can judge for yourself whether or not this is funny or not. Um, the book that I'm showing here is um, Senekiev's book, World Champion at the Third Attempt. He won the World Championship um, about 12 years ago, and he assumed on the day that he won that there would be a brass band outside his Moscow apartment. He was just, you couldn't believe that his, his good fortune and luck, he had really demolished the field. And to his chagrin, there was no brass band. And in fact, he went a year without the slightest bit of attention or anything of the sort. And so he decided to write this book. And it's, a, for me, a delightful title. Because this was not the first or second, but the third time that he actually managed to get in the final word about that. So in order to get into the final, you have to go into a preliminary section. I did. It was 17 players. Only the top two then go on. And you go on to the candidates, which for me was 17 players. And only the top two from the candidates go on to the final. That was a 15-player section, and obviously only one person wins the World Championship. So the odds are stacked against you. He failed, but tried again, and then tried again, and finally wrote the book, World Champion on the Third Attempt. These are emails, which you can't possibly read, I'm sure. It's too small. One of these, these are both from friends. One is Tanzel Turgut from Turkey, who was, wrote to me, and he said, this is my third time going into the final. This other one is from Dan Fleetwood. This is his second attempt at the final. And I, of course, want them all to know that this is, I won my championship on my first attempt. I'm sorry, that's not, a, that, it's funny that correspondence chess players find that very amusing. There we go. From funny or attempted funny to something extremely serious. And these are the intellectual giants who underlay the work that I have done. These are my personal heroes. And I wanted to give a word at least about why their pictures are up here on the screen. Gary Kasparov, um, whose picture is actually not here, which is interesting, um, because the other guys are more important to me philosophically, wrote a fantastic series of books, seven parts called My Great Predecessors. And it was his hypothesis, spoiling seven volumes, you won't mind if I do that here. Um, his hypothesis in this seven volume series is that every new world champion brought something new to chess. I believe that to be true. And I wanted to focus just on four of them and what their contribution is. And again, if you don't care about what I'm saying in terms of the chess, let your mind wander to what it is that you do. Um, the first of these in the upper left is Jose Raul Capablanca of Cuba. Reputation for not being a hard worker, completely unfounded. But this is somebody who brought something amazingly new to the game. An almost effortless, an almost effortless dedication to one idea. And that was that it was not important what move I played. It was important, rather, where my pieces belong. My knight might be on f3. I know that it belongs on d5. My goal is to get it there. My rooks are on a1 and f1. My goal is to put them, double them on d. He simply understood this at some gut level. It came effortlessly to him. And this was a contribution. He understood that his king might be on g1, but if it sat on b7, he'd be winning the game. He was beating people, and they did not understand why they were losing. That is the mark of a champion. Fellow in the upper right is my personal hero, Tigon Petrosian. He built on that idea that it's not what move I play, but where do my pieces belong, by putting together this into a kind of Chinese puzzle box. I don't know if you're familiar with these. They're little, these little rectangular boxes. And if you rattle them, there's clearly something inside. It's usually a worthless penny, but that's not the point. There's something inside. And in order to solve it, you have to slide the top. Then you have to do something on the side. Then you've got to do another slide, and then a, then a pop, or something of the sort. Some of these are amazingly elaborate. 
They can involve 50 or 100 steps. The simple ones involve four. And after you solve five or six or 10 of them, they get pretty easy after a while. But the first one, if you've never seen one, can be a miracle. This is what he brought to chess. The idea that I have to first take a piece off the board. Then I've got to get my rooks here. Then I have to exchange this off. Then get my queen here and finally bring my king to a3 and my opponent's position will crumble. Again, he did this. He beat people effortlessly. They had no earthly idea why they were losing. But this is what he did, and he parlayed this into two world championships. Fellow on the left is Anatoly Karpov. And Annette, another personal hero, he's the one who beat Fisher because Fisher didn't show up, but he defended his title. And he played mirror, just miraculous chess in the 1970s. Um, there's this wonderful conversation that he had with a reporter. A reporter looked at him and said, you know, Kasparov said that you're a, a minimalist, that you're not trying to find the best move or win every game. And, and he said, you know, you can, you can level that charge if you want to. I regard myself as a maximalist. I'm not trying to win every game. I'm trying to win every tournament. And this was his way of poking fun at Kasparov. But he did. He went through a miracle time in the late 70s where he won 12, 13, 14 tournaments in a row. And his contribution built on Petrosian contribution extending that logic was to extend that kind of thinking about what I need to do and in what order to specific structures. There are structures when the pawns get set in any position. We call that a structure and the structures, many of them have names. And he did this within specific structures and he understood these and where pieces belong within those structures. And again, he defeated people without them understanding or having a clue why they were losing. I put Magnus Carlsen up here, not because he's just an amazing player, but because he's had an amazing contribution. He extended that same kind of thinking. There's a progression here. And his thinking was to take Petrosian and Karpov, not for specific structures, but throughout the entire opening book. He actually went through every structure, not some of them, all of them. And in every single structure, before the game starts, he simply understands exactly what the Petrosian-like plan is. He can defeat you at the board without using any neurons. He is just an exceptional player. He knows exactly what's happening. And to take his chess and to reverse engineer it is the thrill of a lifetime. And I, I wish that upon all of you at some point. It is an astounding thing. He is not the only modern player who's done what I've just described. Almost all of the modern players have figured this out, and they're all doing it. He just happens to do it remarkably well. All right, databases. So this is a sense of the kind of environment that we correspondence players are using. If you come away with the impression that this is just as expensive as golf, you're making a mistake. It's more expensive than golf. Um, it's not just the server, but what's on there. So Chessbase 17 is an astounding program. It not only stores as it not only provides the ability to work with all of this, to, to, to provide you with access to all those containers, but as you'll see, it provides a range of tools to work with the games in those containers. The mega database from 2023, 2024 is just out, sorry I didn't update this, contains 10 million games. It says 9.75, the latest one's over 10 million games. These are Grandmaster and Master games. It's an astounding achievement, and many of these games are personally annotated by the people who play them. Correspondence Chess Database has also just been updated in 2024. Again, this is not the database that I rely on, but of course, we correspondence players just get everything. You don't want, you don't want your opponent to find something that you haven't found. This is simply a collection. It's a, a container, a collection of all the correspondence games played from the earliest days, from eight, the 1820s, when towns played towns, all the way through modern correspondence chess. And then there's an opening encyclopedia, not what you might imagine. Um, this actually contains articles written by grandmasters and videos about all sorts of openings um, all the way through. So again, if you have a position all the way up through move 18 and you go in here, you can instantly find every reference to every one of those articles that might be of some interest um, to you. There are other large databases to be sure. I mentioned, I mentioned the ICCF archive. That's the one, the second one here. It is not the largest, but it is the highest quality of all of these databases that has the wonderful merit of being completely and totally free. This is chess publishing. I mentioned this. These are games that are annotated by grandmasters, some of them myself. This is TWIC, The Week in Chess, which has been, been assembled for the last 30 years by Mark, Mark Crowther. I have no earthly idea where he gets his money or how he's able to do this, but he dutifully puts up five to 6,000 games every single week. 
And there are places like Chess Mail. This one's run by a fellow named Tim Harding. Absolutely astounding. And he's put together the largest correspondence chess database in the world. Correspondence chess is not just done through the ICCF. There are chess leagues in the United States and in Germany and elsewhere. And he has dutifully kept track of all of this. And because he's a close personal friend, I get the updates as they come out. This one I'm prepared to demonstrate. I have it running in the background. This is the largest database of all time, and it's relatively new. This is a neural net database put forth by the Chinese. I don't, don't know the names. I only know that it is an astounding achievement. And about 200,000 positions are being added to this amazing database every single day, to give you a sense of just how large this is. Um, and everything's here. And you can manually put in your moves, and it will tell you precisely what neural nets believe is the best move, so that you can spend your time, if you want to, figuring out how to run a neural net on your server, or you can just come here and have it tell you what the neural net tells you to do. I think that both are required, and when I get into the literature that I'm reading, you'll realize that in order to compete at this level, that you not only need all the equipment and all the databases, but you also basically need the equivalent of a computer science degree. So preparing for an opening, again, think of these databases as containers. And in this case, the container is of the games of my opponent, in this case, of Dan Fleetwood. And what this does, actually, this is the opening reference. So this is for a specific opening. So the container, in this case, is all the games in a specific opening variation. It happens to be in the Sicilian, the Nigro variation of the Sicilian, with Bishop E3. If anybody cares, you probably don't. You shouldn't need to. But all of the games in that variation are in this database. And with Chess Space, I am able with a single mouse click to place all of those games within this window. So that while there are thousands of, well, about, about 1,200 games here, 13, 14, 1,500, something like that, there are about 1,500 games in a fairly advanced variation here. And I'm able to play through all 1,500 games at the same time. That is the kind of power, and again, let your mind wander to what it is that you do and having access to everything in your field at the same time, this effortlessly. This is where this life is going for all of you, no matter what you do. Here, the containers, all right, so that's, that's there are different kinds of containers, I might add. If I'm preparing against a certain player, then I can easily search for all the games that Mr. Fleetwood has ever played. And those are now the games that enter into this database. And again, I play see them all at precisely the same time so that I can start playing against him and imagining, not imagining, but literally forecasting precisely where my game against Mr. Fleetwood is likely to be under 15, 20, 25. And I can do so with extreme accuracy. So how do I do something that breaks free of this environment? So here's the opening research. And this can be remarkable in its why am I spending 14 hours a day for 12 years? Well, the first of these are the engines. So within this environment, we can literally run engines, and there are different engine types. I suppose I should just briefly mention that there are two types of engines here. The first, from that former research that you already saw at Princeton, these are brute force algorithms. So we have, for every move that's played, there are X number of responses. And every one of those responses, there are 20 responses, and on and on. And in a brute force engine, it's going to look at everything. It's going to look at, at the, the washed and unwashed. It's going to look at moves that look good. It's going to look at bad moves. It's going to look at everything. And it takes a while. And even when you throw massive amounts of processing power, it's really hard to move from four moves deep to five to six to seven. You have massive advances in processing power, and perhaps it adds one ply, that's one half move, to the search. It doesn't get you as fast and as far as you might like. Um, the latest engines operate in a completely different way. They're not looking at everything in every response. These are the neural net engines, and they are attempting, in their own way, to emulate human play. They're attempting to forecast where this game is likely to go by simply playing in a human-like way on both sides and forecasting what the likelihood is of white or black prevailing in that context. It is a completely new way of proceeding. And so there are two type engine types that tend to be used. One is Stockfish. It is free. Stockfish 16 is available for download at no charge, and it is a neural net type engine. Um, recommended. It doesn't require enormous amounts of processing power. It runs a bit hot, meaning that you need to dumb down the number of cycles on your machine or dumb down the number of, of core that you use. It will run hot, but those are details you probably don't need to hear. 
the, the, the brute force engines can be run at top speed. They tend to run a lot cooler, and they are really interesting. And the two don't necessarily agree. So it's important, in fact, to run both. As processing power has advanced, and boy, are these engines amazing. I have discovered that certain engines, brute force engines, running at very high depth provide clarity that they did not provide at lower depth. You do get more clarity if you let it run, not for an hour or two, but for three or four or five days, even at this processing power. So yes, you can talk to my wife. We have one of the highest electric bills in the history of the state of New Jersey. One of the cool things here is that there's a facility within chest space called Let's Check. That if I start running this thing, it actually records the runs if you allow it to turn this off. But if somebody always already run in this position for five days, it's going to tell you what engine already did this and what it found. So that you don't have to kill a tree here. You can rely upon somebody else's run in Bulgaria or wherever they happen to do it. Livebook is another astounding facility that it's recorded all of those Let's Check runs in a single place. So it's a single database that simply provides an overview of all the computer runs that have ever been run. And this used to be the largest database in the world until the Chinese came along with that neural net database, which is blowing everybody away. And again, if you're wondering what's the URL for that, I'll provide these slides. You don't have to worry about, worry about that kind of thing. I've already talked a little bit about this in preparing for an opponent, that in ICCF play, if you finish a game, it is instantly saved into the ICCF game archive so that's just not an issue. You're going to find every game that your opponent's played. Sadly, they will also be able to find every game that I've played. So the real key here is making certain that my opening repertoire is solid. One of the single mistakes, again, let your mind wander here. I think this has implications for all sorts of activities that have nothing to do with chess. Started playing over the board chess. I love it. Love the thrill of playing over the board. But the openings and the approaches that I used over the board were what I would call suboptimal. When you put them into that Chinese neural net database or any of these other engines, it's going to tell you this is not the right move. This is not going to give you your best chances. I still like playing that way. These are openings I learned from my Uncle Joe, and, and, and there's a fondness that comes from just the familiarity of working with old lines. But the key is not, key to success, is not getting tied up in the conventional modes of thought that you've been doing for the last 20 years. If you continue thinking in the same ways over and over and over again, the machines are going to destroy you. And it's not just chess. It's important to stay up on the literature if you're a lawyer. It's important or a doctor. You can't just sort of rely upon the way in which you learned it or your practice was. You have to stay very, very, very. Use the AI. Use what it provides to stay current as a person. That's what I'm trying to say. So there are tools for middle games and end games. I mentioned Karpov as an example. And I mentioned Carlson as being the master of structure. So I have a structure here on the left. I put it in here in this little box. And if I simply click OK, it is going to give me instantly. It's going to bring up every single position out of 10 million that reach this structure. I will tell you, you can let the engine run for a few days, but this is more power. By playing through the 100 or 200 games that it throws at you, you're going to instantly know where your pieces belong. You're going to know what works. You're going to see what grand, the conclusions that grandmasters have come through. So, my goodness, yes, how many games should you be playing through every day? I don't know what the answer is. Obviously, one makes you the best in your family. Five makes you the best in your town. Ten makes you the best in your state. Fifty will get you to be a national champion. Um, but using this facility, it might not surprise you at this point that I'm playing over two to 300 a day. And I'm actually exaggerating it way down because I don't want to scare anybody to death, but it's so easy to play over dozens, hundreds of games like this. Finally, we come back to the contribution from Richie and Thompson and Brian Kernahan. This is the work that they did, believing that with a brute force engine that is processing power increased, that they would be able to get to the end of the game because the end of the game they felt could be solved. They were for every, if I put five units on the board, I'm going to get a verdict and use the engines ahead of time to calculate every verdict for any possibility of five units on the board. Here in this position, there are six units on the board, two rooks, two pawns, and two kings. And the, this gives me, it tells me, this might surprise some of you, because it looks like white's winning, white's up two pawns. This is a draw. It's not an easy draw, but it's 
a known draw in, in, in the table base. It, it, is, it is difficult. You'll notice, by the way, that there's only king to g7 incoming up draws. Every other move here loses. That's astounding. So this becomes a, a real burden for the defender in an over-the-board game, not a correspondence game. But their interest was in solving the game. So they solved 5p, the five-piece table. Every single possibility of five units on the board. About a dozen years later, that got up to six. About 15 years later, I'm, I'm, I don't know the dates off the top of my head, it got to seven. Um, I never thought that eight would be solved in my lifetime, but they're, they're very close to solving eight, it turns out, using some rather remarkable techniques. The, the work on seven was first done at Moscow State University as a result of the war in Ukraine. That got hacked, and a lot of the data was lost. The tragedies to war, and I'm not being funny here, um, but we still have the seven now, and the eight is making significant progress. Um, but that doesn't solve the game, because it turns out that although we've made just as much progress in the opening, and the end game is just astounding, the work, this work, it turns out that the conversation in the middle of the game is profoundly more complex than we could have imagined. And I will get to that when I show off some of the chess. It is not a small little conversation that is shrinking. It turns out that when chess is played correctly, that conversation can be mammothly long and intense. This is the reading that I've been doing. Uh, this is very different than the reading that I used to be doing. I used to read lots of opening books. I used to read, love chess biographies and the rest. I grew up on Fisher's 60 memorable games. I still recommend that to anybody who hasn't read it. It's an astounding achievement as a piece of literature, even though Fisher didn't write it and Evans did. This is the literature that I'm looking at. And although my background is technical, these, these six books are really about the technical environment involved in neural net processing and its extension to chess. And again, I don't want to scare you, but it's entirely possible within the realm that you live in that you too, or the people you work with, or somebody in your office, or somebody is going to start looking at the extension of neural net technology to what it is that you do on a day-by-day -day basis. Whether it's programming, or law, or medicine, or anything of the kind, not to displacing you, and not to putting you out of work, but to making you more productive. That is certainly my hope. The most interesting of these books for the moment, or rather, I should say, the one that I'm currently reading is the one in the middle at the top, Reengineering the Chess Classics. So Matthew Sadler got hold of Out to Zero and started running this against what he regarded as the most famous games. I disagree with him completely about his decision about which games were the most famous. But putting that aside, of course I would say that, but putting that aside, it is astounding what he found. And that is that all of these amazing classic games were all flawed. Fundamentally flawed. There are, it's astounding what these machines have discovered about the great accomplishments of mankind that we are about to use a bad word. I can't, I won't use that, but we are we are very flawed as people, that even the most talented of us um, are not capable of playing um, at least over the board on par with what these machines are now able to do. Um, I took the leap. The, the natural thought was, well, gosh, I'm really proud of my old games. Surely my old games are going to withstand the scrutiny of these neural net engines. And so, yeah, I did it. And I discovered that I'm an idiot too, that I was also making huge numbers of mistakes. And when I won some of these, I won the US championship. I won the North American title. And I made horrible mistakes throughout all of that. You'll see some of the games, they're beautiful, but they're flawed. Almost all of them are. And the discoveries that were made were completely and totally humbling. Um, in ways that I can't even begin to describe. These are the conventional brute force engines um, that are still available out there. I still think they have some charm. My feeling about these, I guess I'm being a little bit repetitive, is that these tend to provide really cool opinions only if run at very high depth on very powerful machines for a very long time. And these are the more interesting new uh, neural net engines. Um, Layla Chess Zero, Alpha Zero is the um, first of these. And it, it, you've all heard of the term regenerative AI and the rest. And so what is it that, that is going on here? The easiest parallel is to describe how regenerative AI works with language. So let me start with that. It may be that I'm already speaking to people who understand how this works. But when posed a question, these, these little bots they don't know anything about your question about the, the financial implications of uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, an inverted rate, rate curve, but they can figure out what the next letter is, the next word, 
they start answering your question, obviously, with a tremendous amount of speed behind them. And their first answers are just gibberish. Instead of a word, it might include an ampersand or something crazy. But a month later, this, this is starting to actually mimic an answer that starts to read like it makes some sense. And then after six months, this answer is astounding. And although it still contains some really annoying factual errors, and then after six months or a year, this thing's still growing. It starts to sound a bit more like an economist, and then it just keeps growing. And then after a year and a half, it's, it's starting like someone you want to hire to manage your portfolio. Um, in chess, um, these things just started playing against themselves. It took Leila Alpha Zero the better part of six hours to decide that the French defense was suboptimal, not the best choice. It took me 15 years to come to that decision. Okay. I agree with it. I, I mentioned this at the Marshall Chess Club, that the French defense was suboptimal, and I started, there were people out there who wanted to throw things at me, so I'm, I, you're a better audience than the Marshall, so, so I thank you for that. Um, but that's what's happening. Um, France is a really interesting one. This is being recorded, so I need to be a little careful, but the programmer there, a guy named um, Albert Silver, simply took the Stockfish code, which is completely free and available to you. If you go to Stockfish 16 download, you can download it and have fun. Um, but these files um, have two parts. Um, one of them is the weights, and the other is just some, some history here. The, the rules of chess. It basically takes solving the rules of chess, program completely accurately. It can do this for any game. It did this for Go, and it solved it. Solving Go? It did this for Othello. It solved Othello? Oh my goodness. It just has the rules of chess, and then it has weights that are from its experience in playing against itself or weights that you can try to put in by selecting a selection of games, which is what I have done. I've tried to manipulate this using, I'll give out the secret here, why not? Um, using my own games and using strong correspondence games and having this engine um, play using experiences that I value as opposed to experiences that I don't value. And then Fritz came in with Albert Silver and he put in, used the same code he just put in his own weights and sold this as a commercial product. This got sued, and um, so Fritz is, I think, was withdrawn from the market for some period of time. And they have to, they have to acknowledge what it is that they're selling and what it is that they did. But these are these are your these are your entries into this kind of environment. So I promised before I turned to the chess that I would actually answer these questions and answer them very honestly. So I will do so now. Uh, yes, people do still play correspondence chess. There are people leaving the game, uh, quite a number, but many of us, despite the fact that it's becoming so hard to prevail, the challenge is mammoth and cool, and I think by extension that means that the challenge for all of you in whatever field you have, that that challenge is still alive, alive and well. How do we know you didn't cheat? Because there is no way to cheat. There is nothing that you can imagine that I could do that is nothing illegal. I am allowed to use these engines, these databases, and the rest. The only thing that I can't do is to show my games to you while they're in motion. I can't get help from grandmasters or other people, and I can't imagine anybody playing this level who would risk it, or who would do such a thing. And besides, you know, sharing it, sharing it in that kind of environment isn't going to lead you very far. Um, how does a 70-year-old win? Well, because I'm peaking. I know that was that's the funny line in the introduction that I'm just peaking. I don't know that my wife would fully agree with that conclusion, but the reality <laughs> is that I have time on my hands. I was fortunately able to retire early. And I put the time in, I have more time than young people who have homework to do. And I was physically able to do this. And I don't know at what other age it would have been possible to do this kind of work. Uh, you can judge for yourself whether I'm mentally with it or not. I think that I am, I'd like to think that. Why not just let a computer make every move? That's an interesting question. Um, and it raises all sorts of problems. Because what happens when the brute force engine tells you to play rook at A to D and the and the, the, the neural net engine tells you to play rook at A to E and you now have two different opinions? The human has to arbitrate. And the far better way to do is to bring up the structure, play through all the games, find out when, when, when the rook is profitably on D or E or whatever. And you're still there as a human being arbitrating in a computer-driven environment. And I think that has implications for everything that you do as well. Won't the player with the most powerful engine win? That's not at all my experience. I, I think that you, the far more important aspect of this is technical proficiency and knowing how to work with the environment that I've described. Um, did I get lucky? Of course I did. But you know, if you ask any person who became a world champion, they're gonna tell you I think the same thing. 
that there is a, a, a bit of luck involved in any of these victories, and it doesn't change how I feel. Um, there is an endorphin rush when you win a game. There's a nice endorphin rush when you win a tournament. Uh, the endorphin rush when you become world champion is extremely, it lasts a long time, and it really feels good. If you can't tell, I'm still kind of really happy about this. And then the, 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 the end of the start question, so what's the best engine? Um, on the neural net side, the easiest one certainly is Stockfish 16, and it's available for free, which is cool and fun to play with. And on the brute force side, uh, it's my experience that Houdini 6.03 is really outstanding, only at very, 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 very high depths. Um, at lower depths, there is no meaningful distinction to be had among the brute force engines. This one provides some very interesting coverage when allowed to run. These are the more interesting questions. Um, why isn't everybody rated 2560? Uh, uh, the reason is that if you start out playing right now in this drawish environment, it's really hard to get your rating up. And it's not that people aren't really able to compete, but somebody rated 2100 is never gonna get paired against me. I'm never gonna get into a tournament with somebody who's rated under 2400. I'm just not gonna do it. Now that I won the world championship, I'm getting amazing invitations to events with everybody's rated over 2500. So a draw is not gonna cost me much, if anything. I'm not going to play against you 2100. It's not that you're not good enough. It's that I'd be putting my rating on the line and it's not worth the risk. Um, why do neural net engines still beat other neural net engines? The, the answer is surprising, perhaps. And that is sometimes because they're forced to play suboptimal lines by their programmers. Um, if left to their own devices and allowed simply to play, the result is almost certainly going to be a draw. Uh, why are some correspondence players still winning? And I can bring up some of those, and that'll be the second part of this talk. Um, because some of my opponents still to this day play suboptimal lines, lines that they inherited from their grandfather, lines that don't pass muster with the neural nets, but they haven't bothered to do the work to check it. They love playing the French. It just makes them feel good. And so they play it, even though it's the wrong choice. Then is correspondence chess the canary in the coal mine? You can gather by now, I believe that the answer is yes, that, that no matter what it is that you do or want to do or are planning on doing, it's going to be very different than your grandpa's environment. And this is going to hit our economy in ways that are unexpected. Now, people lost their job on the line at Ford and GM back in the day and didn't get their overtime, and there was a generalized revolt. But imagine what that revolt looks like when this hits professionals like lawyers and doctors and architects and the rest and programmers, and that their jobs are suddenly in jeopardy. The world is changing. And so for you young people who are listening, uh, get the broadest <laughs> liberal arts education, I still think there's enormous value, so that you can go with the flow, because that's the best possible advice that anybody can possibly give you. And don't be afraid to take a few courses of computer science so that you can cope with neural networks and have a better sense of what it means to interact with them. Because what is at heart here, the key to all of this, is the interaction between the human and the machine, the machine-computer interface, work that's being championed by a guy named Ed Tenner, proud to do right wrote an article that involved my, my, my thoughts on the rest. So this is the end of this part. Those of you who don't want to see any chess, and I would certainly have compassion to anybody who wants to read it. Um, what I have in mind for the second part of this talk is, first of all, to show some rapidly, some of the really fun chess from the early days when chess was fun, before the neural nets emerged and when the attacks were dissimilating. That strikes you as cool, great. And then right at the end, just one or two examples of what chess has turned into. Um, and that's likely to scare some of the hairs off your back. And I, I'm sorry about that. I don't like ending on such, such, but I wanted to be completely candid and the rest. Let me take a few questions, if I may, before before we move on to the chess, because I think that's the right thing to do. Yes? I just read an article somewhere that uh, there was a chess game, I think it was Stockfish, that could be Magnus Carlson every time he would never even draw against it. Is that the case? I don't think so. In no small part, because he, like all grandmasters, like me and the rest, we train against the thing all the time. Um, we know what works best against these machines. We have a decent sense of what to do. We know what structures to get into. Dr. still has trouble with some structures. The, the key for human beings, and I didn't say this before, I apologize, but the key is not to get into some tactical melee with these machines. You are going to lose. The key is to get into one of those structures that I was talking about and be patient, be willing, as Petrosian did, as Carlson does, to be willing to 
maneuver your pieces behind that structure glacially, be more patient. The machine does not understand that kind of maneuvering. If there's a bad bishop in the position, a bishop where the, all the pawns are fixed on its color, it's not going anywhere, it's stuck. A human being sees this. Sometimes the, sometimes the machine sees a bishop on the board and doesn't understand that it's pretty compromised. So there's still an advantage at the highest level. That doesn't mean you should play against this expecting to win. Yes? Is there a uh, separate chess 960 correspondence? Chess yes. Membership? Also within the ICC. Classical, right? I, the, the, that, that's simply where they set up your pieces at the starting position more ran randomly so that um, they can be done in a variety of ways. It can be done for you, or you can start putting your pieces down so that it's not the, the initial configuration we've all been taught, but whatever. And this was meant to get away from opening theory. Sadly, there are a finite number of combinations of, of, of different placements of the pieces, and the best players in 960 have managed to put together opening theory for every possible configuration there, too. Um, that's sad, quite so. But, <laughs> and quite contrary to what Fisher and others had in mind when they tried popularizing that approach. Does everybody want to see some chess? All right, so we have this position out here. Let's open it up. Anybody care to offer? Well, there are there's an ancient student of mine over there, and I have two students here, and I think they might know the solution. So I'm going to call on non former and current students if they have an idea here about what the solution is. It is white to move and win. I mean, this is, by way of background, this is one from one of my earliest correspondence games played in 1972. So I was an undergraduate at Princeton when I had this position in a, in a real in a correspondence game played by postcard. Uh, it's on. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, bring the king to the right side. King to the right side. So something like king to e2 or king to e1, yeah. something like that. And right. the Does the anyone want to agree with that or go off in a slightly different direction? Nobody wants to be bold here. That was very bold. I mean, I, I don't really see it, but I, I, I mean, if I were playing, I'd probably start by playing a5 to try and lock down the yeah. the queen side, and then and then maybe go off. To the so side. what he's saying is basically, if I play a5, I'm for, I, I'm fixing the structure on this side of the board, and that there's some charm in that, king to e2, recognizing that there's some action on the king's side, seems logical, and, and sadly, and I'm not trying to insult anybody here, but neither of those moves works. It turns out that black has a threat in the position, and the way in which we operate here is that the first thing that we're supposed to do when we're playing is to ask the question, all of my students know this, okay? We ask the question, is there a threat? Actually, the first thing we do is we ask, is Black's last move really silly? And that's not the case. Does Black have a threat? It turns out that Black is, it's White's move, but Black is threatening simply to go here. And the moment this happens, no matter what we've locked down over here or where I put my king, I can't migrate over here, because there's always a threat of this pawn majority crashing through uh, with g5 to g4 going here. If my king tries to win the, win the roost on the queen side over here, this, this Black's going to get a queen. So it turns out that the only solution in this, and it's astounding, but only in correspondence chess, are we able to make moves like this? This is astounding. I mean, it, it, it's ugly looking. It looks like it's wrong, and the computers hate this move, because it instantly seems to lose a pawn. Of course, the pawn can't be taken uh, logically, because White's king now can rush over, and there's no way for Black to secure the pawn. He can try really hard. But as he rushes, you can see the problem that he's got. This winning this pawn. He's, he's got an outside passer. Isn't that going to work here? Not really, because Black's king is about to have a nervous breakdown. What do I mean by that? He has to defend the pawn on h. But if he goes back to defend the pawn on h, he is also going to wind up, as you can see, having a problem here in the middle of the board. He just can't be in two places at the same time. This problem is even more unusual, and one of the reasons the computer can't solve it, because Black can play very cleverly here push through with g4. And again, black has a threat. We ask the same question. By the way, every grandmaster on the planet has been trained to ask this question. What is the threat? The threat is to play h5. And the moment that h5 is played in this position, there is no way for white to win. And because the king, again, has to stay over here, he's got to stay within what we call the square of the pawn, that if I pop over to here, there's no way to stop this pawn. Waiting. So 
now that we understand that after 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 this move g4, he's threatening to play h5. The only move that wins is this horrible looking move, h5. Now everybody here is suddenly saying to themselves, wait a minute, my you know, all the hairs are sticking up on my back. This can't be, this can't work. Because the king is going to rush over and take the h4. We can all see this. There's no way to defend it. But again, Black's king is suddenly having this nervous breakdown. He has to stop the, he wants to take the h pawn, but if he takes the h pawn, this pawn will queen. The outside this square of the pawn. The pawn forms a square. There's the queening square. There it is. And it's got four vertices. It's a square. And if he takes, he's got to he's got to stay within the square of this pawn in order to make sure that he gets to it. And he can't do that by taking the pawn. He can be aggressive here, but there's a limit to how aggressive he can be. And he can't simultaneously, he can't keep me out and prevent the d-pawn queening. And so there it is. We win this one, and now we're going to win the other one. And this is just an amazing little endgame. I bring this to your attention because the brute force algorithms really struggled with this for decades. They struggled with this for decades. It was harder, in fact, because this was the position, and and you know, there's an exchange of rooks here before we actually get to the key position with h4. The brute force algorithms at low depth don't handle this very well. But now with immense processing power, if I turn it on, it'll find it pretty quickly. But the neural nets find this within a quarter second. If you find that really scary, you kind of should, because obviously we poor humans, it takes quite a human being to be able to overcome what's happening here. And again, if we use this as a metaphor for what's happening in other realms, this is a little bit, I think it's kind of scary. All right, any questions about this before I, I move on? Anybody not convinced that H4 is winning or wants to see another line? There are lots of lines here. I see you found it. I did find it, yeah. And and the cool thing about this is that I found this in a pre-computer age. This is, I think, just really a cool step for humanity, uh, at least back in the 70s. But our judgments obviously change. So the extent that I have notes, it's that I put together a list of the games I wanted to show you. So this is a game from one of my, from the US Championship. And it's, I'm kind of spoiling it a little bit here. Cool. And this is white to move and win. My idea in the position is that I'd like to play h6, but he can defend quite well with this move, and I'm just not able to get my queen where it wants to go. This is a check with a subsequent mate on g7. So instead of playing h6, I played this nice move, queen to f5. Instead of making those, and I'm saying it, but the threat is stronger than the execution. And then if I play h6, I don't win. But if I threaten to play h6, that's how I go about winning. I think that also carries across to other venues. He took one of my bishops, and it was h6. And it happens to be, yes, it's here. It's checkmate performance. So this is, we have to do this. We have an audience, and you all have the opportunity to solve this. The key for all of my students is that we look at all four single first. So we look at all checks and captures. If they don't work, don't don't throw your stuff away. But if they do work, well, play it. <laughs> so we have to open this up because it's a forced mate. Go ahead. I see a sort of the hand uh, didn't, get, didn't quite get above the nose, but I, I know what that means. I, I'm double checking. It's okay. Pawn uh, takes. Pawn takes. Good. Rook takes. Oops. Let me do it this way. Because he actually resigned here, which is why this is in the notes. Uh, yeah. He can't take with the king. If he takes back with the king. Um, rook takes on h7 is checkmate. We can demonstrate this right there. That's checkmate. Very pretty. But he's going to take it back with the rook. And so you're up. It's made in, made in three. And then uh, rook takes h7. Now, for those who say, gee, don't play rook takes h7 because you're losing the rook, my point is that all masters are required to look at this move. If it doesn't work, you're not going to play it. But if it does work, then we should play it. Maybe two. Keep going. You're doing great. Sorry, my clock, I lost the calculation. That's all right. No, this isn't math class. It doesn't have to be fast. I like accurate queen and I like speed. Absolutely. Good job. There's our checkmate. And by the way, this, this conforms to what I call coach's first law, which is black's, black's king cannot move. Oh, if, if, if your opponent's king can't move, all you need is check. There it is. Very pretty. That was a win, really an honest to goodness win in the U.S. Championship. You can see these games are fun. This was also in the U.S. Championship. I don't have a way of hiding this, so you're just going to have to bear with me here. You see, put us in training mode now, so I don't, don't completely pass this. Bishop h6. 
this year, no, I picked first. All right, white smooth and win. This is again from my win in the 10th United States Championship. I used to think it was a really a hot shot thing to be a US champion. Then I became world champion and I don't really talk about the US titles anymore, but the trophy for the US title was nicer than the trophy for the world champion. <laughs> and again, I throw this out to you. I, it, it, as a hint for anybody who's done research, I named my website that this month. Not much of a hint, sorry. But this is the scintillating old chess before the computers took over and just changed the game. And we were able to produce really lovely chess. All right, I have a hand over here. Go ahead. Um, is there something with queen d6? Well, it is a queen move, but not to, not to, not getting it into g6, although that's. Sorry, d6? To okay. Say again, David 6? Yeah. Very good. Nicely done. So everybody here is saying, hey, he's going to take the queen. We're still required to look at this because it's a check, right? He didn't take it. But if he had, is this check not going to come forward because that's, this is a beautiful little checkmate in the middle of the board. And if he goes back, the beautiful thing about this is everybody should be seeing rook to a7, rook takes pawn. But it turns out there's something even better. Because if I play rook takes a7, although it's check and I win the queen, I can do better than that by cutting off his escape square in g8, so that now rook takes on a7, the threat, checkmate. This is just nice chess. None of this happened. None of this happened because he didn't take the queen. How annoying. <laughs> and, and I played here, he resigned here, but let's show you why. Bishop takes, look over, he took here, here. And we'll use this as a puzzle too, because it's just fun. Black's king, again, cannot move. So first law is an operation, all we need is check. I have to be careful here because black has a threat, playing rook takes c2 with an enormous attack. The way the rook would be happy to you get you take the initiative. But it is checkmate in three months. H7. Yes, rook h7. We've got a good group here. Rook h7 takes queen here. A very simple checkmate. Nicely done. So that was also from the US Championship. This is again another one of my favorites coming up. This is a lovely game in so many respects because when this was subjected to neural net scrutiny, it was discovered that I had played very poorly here. But we're going to enjoy this game anyway. Um, so, play look over. The idea that I had here was that although my king has to move, the key question is not what should I do with my king. But rather, where does the king belong? And I decided that the answer was on g2, that's the square right here, completely safe from all the checks and not, not getting in the way of any of white's maneuvering. So, although I made this move, is with the idea of tucking the king in on that cool square. We get to this square, so we get to the key, key square, and this is a position. Black again, we ask the question, does black have a threat? And the answer is yes, queen takes nine. So, this is another one of my laws, so let's just make it clear. When your opponent has a threat, in this case, queen takes nine, you have to do one of three things. Why they have to move this, you have to defend it, or you have to find a bigger threat, something that makes you not want to even think about this piece. And if you want to become a master or a grandmaster, it's really pretty important to look for the bigger threat and not always be defensive about, gee, I better move this piece or defend this piece. You want to find a bigger threat. That's exactly what happened. This position is really, it's nice. Brought my rook up. My big threat here is this rook takes on g8. Takes. And again, we have the same problem. Threatening to take the knight, b2. So I either have to move the knight, defend the knight, find a bigger threat. And this is the cool position. This is, you're looking around for, gee, this correspondence just for me. Am I? Is this, is this something cool? Hopefully this next move will sort of knock your socks off because it's really cool. This was played in 92 again. Four machines were good enough to find these kinds of moves effortlessly. So I'm gonna stretch for a minute, give you folks a chance to see what happens. White through the middle. Very 
there are some very strong chess players here, and they are welcome to try. This one's cool. Queen to h4. Queen to h4 is an outstanding thought. So let's show everybody what you're thinking about. All right, I don't have to move the knight if he's in check. He's going to come out of here. That's forced. And I can come in here, here. And as we're calculating this cool variation, we discovered that he's got this escape square on boy seven. And that all I can do is best is to repeat this position. Now, when a master analyzes this, and they do look at your move, they look at it first, and they discover that there's an escape square, they say to themselves in a loud voice without saying it out loud, there's an escape square. So that hand kind of went up to the eyebrows. It makes you want to play rook b8. So it makes you want to play rook b8, which looks like the stupidest bloody move in the world, but it does cover the escape square. And this is the move. Now the famous, the famous, the famous thing, I always included the final comments of my opponents, but the really cool thing about this is that he commented also that he he saw this. He had a routine. He was a bank clerk in Peterborough, New Hampshire, and he would always go out and get his lunch and he'd pick up his mail at the at the post office. And he says that he saw the card with rook b8, and he couldn't eat his soup, and he couldn't eat his sandwich. He was just absolutely distraught because he suddenly realized that I had cut off the escape square. So assuming that he takes the knight here, you're all wondering he's going to take the knight. But now your queen to h4 is cool because there's no escape square. And so this is what winds up happening. And the poor king has to leave, allowing queen takes rook with check no matter where it goes. And so we only have one technical problem to solve. He is threatening queen takes f2 with a mate too. It is real. But I have to find a way to defend this pawn. If I can do that, I'm up a lot of material here. Of course, I have three takes. There are other ways of proceeding, but this is perfectly adequate. And nobody in correspondence, they don't, we don't play this out to mate. When your opponent is completely winning, is a matter of some respect. And um, that's what would happen. How, how much time do you have for your turn? Oh, back in the old days, you were given three, three days. And now? And now? Now you get... Um, 50 days of thought for every 10 minutes. But you can budget it so that if you play the opening very quickly and be tempted, you get to move 10 with maybe 49 days still on your clock, and now it's cumulative, so you get another 50. Now you have to get to move 20, and you have 99 days on your clock. And that's a lot of time. But there are times in the middle game when things of 15 to 20 to 25 days are not uncommon. It can get that complicated. Good question. Um, oh, Mr. Laren, this is just hysterical, so I, I hope I have it here. This is really cool, and it would really bother. Oh, because he's white. That's why I can't find it. There it is. Perfect. Well, so it was even possible back in the day, this is 93, when it was possible, possible to win with black. It is black to move and win. I brought this by to what was then the Princeton Chess Club. I was so proud the game had ended, and I thought, this is such a cool move. And there was a guy named Matt Allman, and he said, I think it's this. That's only rated over 1,400. But sure enough, his move won, too. And then somebody else suggested another move, and sure enough, that move won, too. <laughs> and then another person showed another move, and there, it turns out there are four winning moves here. There's almost no move that you can play that doesn't win. <laughs> but I thought that I had found a really cool way of doing this, so that I should share this with you, because it's really cool. And this conforms to Capablanca's principle, that it's not about what move we play, but rather about where pieces belong. And a master rather quickly sees in this position something astounding. And that is that if this bishop were not here, this move would win instantly. I'm threatening checkmate, and I'm threatening rook takes rook with devastating effect. But sadly, as you can see in this position, there's a bishop in the way. But the bishop therefore becomes what we call a marauder. It takes on superhuman power. They can do things that are really weird and strange and ugly and horrible, and you're probably still going to be okay. So sure enough, I move the bishop. Now, there are two bishop moves that win here. One is just to go here, threatening checkmate. I moved here. I suppose I should do this on the big board. It's prettier. So this is the move that I played. And the idea is that on here, when he does get out to f6 and black and design, because he can... <laughs> To stop the mate. He has to stop the mate, but he's not going to stop Rook takes Rook. Um, but I want to show you what Matt found. So this is astounding. So Matt says, well, I can play Bishop to h4. And you have to stop the mate, and whoops, and I have to stop the mate, and then I can bring the queen out to f6. He's absolutely right. 
And then somebody else suggested, well, I can play knight f2. Sure enough, because now this check happens and the queen comes here and the queen still gets to f6. I don't think it's that pretty, but it's, it's kind of nice. And, and the one that was really astounding, this position is just, that's how bad this is, is that knight to b4 probably wins too. Because in this position, I'm threatening knight to d3 checkmate. And, and if he takes here, I get to go here. Oh my gosh, again, we're looking at all checks and caption. This is such an ugly looking move, but it, you know, oh my goodness, this check is really nasty. And he's got a block with the queen, and I don't take the queen, I take here. He's got to go here and take here because the queen is going. This is just ridiculous. So all of these lines are cool. And at this point, which one do you play is a matter of art rather than which is the best move? Another favorite game, this is from the second US championship. I did not win this one. You'll notice that people are beginning to play. You may be able to tell people are playing a little bit better here, but there's still something astounding about this. Pop us into training mode, and I suppose I should take volunteers at the at this critical moment. Um, the interesting thing about this is that I must have fought for a week and a half here. Um, this was under ICCF rules, so I had the time, and I had two candidates. My knights being attacked. And knight to d5 is one candidate move, the other is knight to b2. This is the other major law that when you have two moves, please know two moves to consider. One is almost always better than the other. I've had students through the generations where is it Mr. Edwards? I'm sorry, if you have two mates in one, how can one be better than the other? <laughs> and of course, the answer is one is always prettier than the other. Well, which one's prettier? That's up to you as the player. So I had two moves here, knight to d5 and knight to b2. And this is really tough because I believe both moves are winning. So which one do we play? The stretch, what do you guys think? Hmm. Sitting too long. <laughs> she can't win here. She's one of my students. She's extremely strong. If she gets it right, she's expected to get it right. <laughs> right? If she gets it wrong, then she'll feel bad. And I I'll feel bad. Right. So no, I won't. So uh, while you're thinking, so there's a funny backstory here, and the backstory is just sometimes extremely not funny. But you can decide. Um, it's being filmed. This is very dangerous. <clears throat> um, so I'll be very truthful. He did won the Golden Knights Championship from the U.S. Chess Federation, which the U.S. Champ the U.S. Chess Federation had built as the U.S. Championship, but it wasn't. The winner simply got an entry into the U.S. Championship. He was inflated and then deflated to realize that he had not quite won what he thought he had won, but here he was in the US 11. I was coming into this as a the highest rated player in the in a postal organization called the APCT, and he had just won the championship at the USCF. So here we were paired in his championship, and it was a matter of some pride. Um, while this game was going on, I was playing another game, a fella in Singapore, and the fella had made a bad move. And when I started punishing it, he wrote on his card the expression, what a wuha, W-H-O-O-H-A. I, I didn't know what the word meant. I was trying to be disrespectful, so I asked my fellow players if anyone knew what a wuha was. Nobody did, but it became our slogan. It's just something that we love to say when something funny happened, we would say, what a wuha. It just sounded funny. Um, after this game ended, I was asked to annotate this game for the APCT news board. So it was only going to be seen by players from the APCT, not from anybody else. And I wrote it up in a very professional way. But I also wrote it up in a very funny way to share with the publisher privately and just some of my friends. And they loved the funny version so much that without telling me, they printed the funny version and not the professional version that I had prepared. And at several moments during the game, I described his moves with the expression, what a hoo-ha. So Ewing and Pennington got paired. It was just a town versus town match. I was on board one, he was on board one. And I sat down at the board and he looked at me straight in the eye and he said, what's a hoo-ha? <laughs> I folded like a cheap suit. That was one of the most horrible moments when I realized that I had been, been had. I was trying to figure out how he had found, anyway, it doesn't really matter. Does anybody have the solution here? Want to offer an opinion? The crowd usually has a significant intelligence. I'll just show you what happened here. The amazing thing about this game is that there are four rook sacks by white. And it's hard to do that when you only have two rooks. Right? So 
the idea here was he wanted to go here. This game, by the way, is also flawed. If you pop this into the neural net, there are all sorts of mistakes. This is extremely disconcerting to be sitting here. If someone's going to sit here with the neural net and say, how could this, how could this have been a great game when Edward should have played this or whatever? It turns out in the original position, I should have played 19 2 All right, back we go. Then I would have been deprived of the four rook sacks. Here's the first one, which he did not take. The only way to have four rook sacks is for some of them not to be taken. Uh, fun lines, the fun lines permeate this game. You can see that this bishop, which looked pathetic, is suddenly coming to life. Big attack on h7. The attack is just rolling in, and you're getting a sense of what these lines look like and how much fun they are to calculate. I go back. This is just fun. So instead of that, he went here, and there's the second rook sack. And again, he can't take this, because if he takes this, we have here, followed by here, followed by here, and the game is over because the queen's getting in to f6. Instead, he took, and he took here. Now he's threatening to take the rook, and I've got to find a way, I love this word, to extricate the rook. This is not just about chess, teaching chess. This is also about expanding the vocabulary of the next generation. So we extricate the rook in this way because if he takes the rook, we have here, here. This is another example of where does the rook belong? Not what move do I play, but if I can get this rook to the, the square g7, which is here, this game is the old g7 with the queen coming in. And, and again, a master sees this very quickly because we've all been trained to think about where pieces belong and not what move to play. I, I'm overstaying my welcome, but I have one more game. Can I do one more or am I done? You can do one more, but we have to be fast about it. Thanks, John. Sorry about that. So I did want to give a sense of where this all heads. So this is my game against Osipov in the World Fund. And I'm going to skip way ahead here. Forgive the speed. I don't expect anybody to follow this. All right. So I'm just going to do this quite manually. The only opportunity for White to win this game, and this game goes on for 119 minutes. Uh, the plan is as follows. Bring up my, my board. In order within this structure, and again, when I say structure, we're talking about Kappa Walker, we're talking about Magnus Carlsen, we're talking about Karpov and the rest. This is the structure. In order to win this game, I have to find a way to get him to move this pawn. Nothing else is going to work. And in order to do that, I had to maneuver my knight here and my bishop here, my queen here. And now putting all this pressure on here forced him to do this. I was able to accomplish that within about 10 minutes. In this position, I've got to find a way to get them to push this pawn. And I accomplished that within 37 moves. I'm not going to go into the way in which that happened. So notice 37 is close to some boy, 50. If there are 50 moves without a, a pawn move or a capture, the game is to draw. And I was able to get him, not with the knight here, get him to do this. I needed then to force him to move here. <laughs> and in order to get him to move here, that method can be forced. But it would have taken something like 106 moves, <laughs> which is way beyond the 50 move rule. And I failed to do it, and the game ended in a draw. I found this extremely frustrating, of course, but it is astounding. And this is the level at which this game was played. And it is an astounding thing. I'm obviously avoiding all the detail because we're way out of time, but that is the nature of, of chess at this level. It is an extraordinary thing. And way beyond the horizon, both of the brute force engines and of even the neural nets. I'll end there and take one or two last questions. Good lesson. Sure, that's okay. It's important to indicate that the fight will always win. The game will be solved and the game will be a draw. It's, 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 yes. it's so close to being solved. I promise to say that. It will be a draw, it will be solved, it will happen within the next. There will be an announcement within the next 15 years for sure. To my satisfaction, it's all right. Last question? Anyone? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think when they, when, when computer engines play each other, they do this thing where they pick some position. That's, that's right. right. So is there any prospect of that happening in human correspondence chess to try and, you know, reduce No, the what they're going to do in correspondence chess is, I'm sorry for this, sound a little technical. Uh, but what's happening is they're going to change a tie, key tiebreaker. So that in addition to making a move, you have to have the opportunity to predict your opponent's move. If you, what this does is eliminate key draw openings. Uh, the Petrov is an example. It goes away because Black's moves are so easily predicted 
that nobody's going to want to play this opening. They're going to lose the tiebreaker. And if we can force Black out of defending in three or four of these openings, that problem with the lid defense of the Warriors and several others, uh, the game opens off some very exciting ways. And the ICCF instituted that at their Congress in Amsterdam at the last meeting. It's feelings about it. I don't like mucking around with the traditional game. Um, but that one rule. Now, this is humans attempting to exercise some control over this new environment. And I think it's a worthy, a worthy attempt. Okay, I'm afraid that's all the time we have. Thank you again, John. No, just excellent.